Okay, so I think we're at three o'clock our time or six o'clock Kuwait, yes. 6 p.m. So um, this is Alison McMenemy, who's the director of Highland Print Studio. And Alison um, McMenemy, what an animal dear. Studio manager. Um, Your studio. Just while we're allowing people to join up, I'll go through. The uh, event has been recorded, so if um, yeah. um, and also we you're all effectively muted, so we'll we'll run through. We're going to show uh, have a few words uh, from various people. We'll show a little film. And we'll do a talk through of the exhibition and we'll have a QA at the end. So uh, if you want to ask questions, you can do it through the, the, the tab at the bottom of your page and also or the raise hand, um, which I think is a tab as well on your page. So uh, I think that's is that all the housekeeping? Mm -hmm. well done. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Good. So I'm going to say a little bit about a project. We were uh, funded by the British Council as part of the UK Gulf Exhibitions Programme um, to, to uh, take an exhibition of contemporary printmaking to venues across the Gulf region. So we, the exhibition started off in Muscat in Oman at Stal Gallery and then went to Al Sakal Avenue in Dubai, then Archamil in Jeddah, Saudi, and was just about to go to Weja Art Centre in Kuwait, and the pandemic struck. It was just days before myself and Jordan were going to go out. We, John and I went out, we installed the exhibition, and we did a program of printmaking workshops and presentations. So um, we were very disappointed not to make it to Kuwait, but the British Council very generously supported the program. So that involves an online exhibition and digital. Um, events. Mm -hmm. So we will be doing <clears throat> workshops. We've sent printmaking materials out to Kuwait, and uh, John is going to be teaching um, printmaking via Zoom. So it's the first time. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. It's exciting because I'm not doing them. <laughs> and but I'm sure it'll be. It, it, it's great to be able to make this connection because the project was um, it was an incredibly enriching cultural experience, uh, and we're just delighted that we're able to make this connection with Wichita and Kuwait. So, firstly, can I just? interrupt there's one bit of housekeeping I forgot which was to let you know that we have got a translator available for if you want to listen in Arabic uh, side is available there is if you go to your interpretation button at the bottom of the screen you can choose Arabic and if you mute the source audio as well you might have to go in twice to do it and that gives you the option of Arabic sorry mm -hmm. I forgot that important one <laughs> Okay. See what rookies at this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, thanks, John. Thanks for that. Um, and I would like to hand you over now to Michael Gordon, who is the British Council um, Country Director for Kuwait. And Michael is going to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. And thank you, John. And um, thank you also to um, Aziz from the Wajha Art Centre. Um, I'm really pleased that we're finally, finally reached the point where we get to launch um, from Alba to Arabia in Kuwait. We were looking forward to it in March, 
um, it was going to be that I think the last stop on your tour, um, we had been working with the Wecha Arts Centre and we would have had um, a launch much like now, but we would have been there with Aziz and colleagues in the Arts Centre. And I congratulate you all and thank you and also my colleagues from British Council for persevering and making it possible for us to enjoy the exhibition um, by, by virtual means. And I'm happy also because I'm in, I'm actually in the UK, as you might be able to see. I just, just arrived from Kuwait and I'm able to attend the launch just the same. So that's, um, that's one of the advantages. But of course, we would have um, preferred, it would have been great to meet you in person. It would have been great to be at the, um, at the Wecha Arts Centre. But I congratulate you and thank you again for making it possible. Um, I really like the prints. Scottish printmaking is a, you know, it's a traditional art form, but the way that you do it is, uh, um, has a really contemporary, very striking modern feel to it. And they're quite, um, quite uh, enriching and engaging images. Um, it's very much the British Council's purpose through arts, education, and uh, English language to bring um, UK expertise, bring things from the UK and connect with people in, in, in Kuwait. Kuwait has a small but um, thriving arts center, arts, um, creative arts scene, um, and uh, with the Wajha Arts Center and others. We're very proud, happy to be in touch with, um, with, with, with this, with, with, with the art scene in Kuwait. And it's, um, you know, I hope that we've um, added something um, that some people will be inspired by it from bringing together Wajha Arts Center and um, Highland Print Studio. And then I hope as many people as possible will, um, that of course they don't have to be in Kuwait, can, um, can join, join the virtual exhibition and take enrichment from it as I and my colleagues have. So thank you once again. And I'm really looking forward to the, to the tour and also to learning a little bit about, about how, how to do it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, great. Um, it's, it's amazing that, you know, if we were in Kuwait, obviously the audience would just be in Kuwait. So the advantage of this is that we've got um, people could be looking from it from anywhere, I suppose. So mm -hmm. uh, I suppose we should say to the other people watching in Scotland um, and other parts of Scotland, we should say greetings from tier one. <laughs> um, uh, you know, maybe if we've got time at the end, Alison might give you a wee demo on how to use soap properly. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, we're going to hopefully now have a few words from Ab uh, Abdul Aziz, who's uh, the who runs um, Wager, the host uh, organisation in the So, if Aziz is there, um, he can hopefully say, say something about. Uh, um, thank you, uh, John and Alison. Um, yes, so I'm going to talk br briefly about Wijha. Um, since you only speak English, you want to know what Wijha means. Wijha means the destination. So, the destination is just destination. It's like the starting point for uh, any artist that he can create the art he likes and um, from there he can grow and uh, this is what actually we we are uh, doing is that um, we try to uh, show people here the importance of uh, the importance of art because in Kuwait we still struggle for uh, the creative scene, uh, as uh, Michael said, it's just um, very small, but it's very powerful. So we need for people to know more about which how we need to more uh, for the people to know more about art in general and the importance of it. Um, and here we host um, exhibitions, we do uh, workshops in every field in arts, like painting, music, calligraphy, uh, sculpturing, everything. And we hope that someday uh, people will know what we're doing, like, for real. So, uh, and I want to thank you for this, because this is uh, the first time we host an exhibition from Europe. Um, 
we hope that you will be here with us to uh, make this thing like a big event. But um, what's happening now? I think it's, as you said, uh, there is some positive side to it. So people can uh, watch us through uh, the social media and uh, online. So we hope we can uh, do something great with it. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Aziz. It's interesting, we, uh, Scotland is unique and um, we think in the world that it has a network of publicly funded production facilities. So there are um, five funded print studios across Scotland. We also have sculpture studios, photography studios and glass. And um, what that does, they're, 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 they're kind of focal points for creativity and it allows absolutely anyone who wants to learn, to learn on professional grade equipment. So it is, we, we're um, incredibly fortunate in this country that we have these creative facilities and across the Gulf region, wherever we went, I think this network of production facilities was found quite inspiring. And we could, we could see there was an incredible demand amongst the artist community for facilities like this. So we really hope that we're um, promoting a model that um, other countries could perhaps think about themselves mm -hmm. and um, uh, and eventually develop that infrastructure because it really it makes creativity accessible and it keeps um, these these skills alive within the artistic community. So um, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I just think uh, I would echo what Alison said. It was a, it was terrific. Um, you know, the, I think beyond any expectations that we had uh, of, of being in, in the places we were, and uh, hopefully at some stage we'll get to Kuwait as well, and maybe hopefully return to the places we, we were already. So, um, so yeah. So to say a little bit about ourselves. Um, we're a, like most of the, the other studios, as, as Alison said, there's four other ones. We're, we're all broadly similar in the way we operate. So we're an open access printmaking studio, which means that people, anyone can come and use the studio once they know what they're doing. So if they don't, we teach them and then you pay uh, an annual fee, a bit like using a gym, I suppose. Um, and that means that the facilities are available uh, for artists or let me say anyone at all to make use of the, the facilities. Um, so the, the, the model I suppose is to try and provide high quality facilities at a low user rate. Um, we also have a community remit so we, we work a lot with community groups as well as um, professional artists, beginners, all sorts of people really. So we, we, we've done various projects which um, maybe take an element of, of the community like um, blanket bogs, for instance, or topics like that involve areas of the community uh, and have artists working on them and it kind of reaches out to all sorts mm -hmm. of individuals and groups. So, so we have a little film that's just a short film that's a kind of taster, uh, an intro to the studio. So we'll just, if I go to screen share just now, um, I should uh, be able to bring this up and you should be able to see it.
Okay, so that's a, a wee taster of Fire and Prince Studio. Gives you a very rough idea of what we do. That um, video always makes me laugh because John edited it and every footage of me has speeded up. I think because he thinks I'm some small, angry person. And <laughs> it's more than think. <laughs> Anyway, what we're going to do now is we'll just uh, take, give you a whistle-stop tour of the work in the exhibition, and um, we'll start that slideshow. Yeah. So again, I'm going to uh, screen share. So this is just an intro slide. Um, that was, this was the, the publicity we used throughout the, the tour. Um, so uh, like we say, you can see from the, the graphic that we initially started in Muscat, a style gallery in Muscat uh, last December, so nearly a year ago. Then uh, on to Dubai with Al Sarkal the House of Traditional Arts at Art Jamil in Jeddah in Saudi, and now to Weja online. So we've put the exhibition into uh, its different printmaking mediums. So we're going to start off with the relief prints. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about relief, mm -hmm. how it's done? Um, relief printing is techniques including line of cut, wood cut, wood engraving, and you have your block and you're cutting away everything that uh, you want to remain white. So it's called relief printing because you're inking up the surface of the block. And we'll show you some examples from the exhibition. This is uh, Dusk by Adia Desenia. You can see, hopefully you can see along the bottom, it gives the image size. So it's, it's quite important to know sometimes with printmaking what the image size is, because it gives you an idea of the level of detail. This is relatively small for Adi, he tends to work bigger. Um, he works primarily, I think, in black and white. He does do some etchings, but mainly would be known for his lino cuts, I think. Um, he does these, with conventional line of cutting tools, but I think also with like Dremel heads, like little drill heads and so on, making marks in the lino. This one's a, a bit bigger, uh, it's 78 centimetres. Um, Adi is Ni from Nigeria, um, but has lived was in, in the UK, particularly in Scotland for quite a while. So his, he tends to have a sort of fusion of almost African and Scottish imagery. Um, brought together in these amazing prints. Do you want me to talk about these mm -hmm. ones? These are mine. Uh, these actually came in between. We did a reconnaissance trip for the project. And these came at the conversation we, we had with Hassan Mir, uh, who's, uh, who runs Style Gallery in Muscat. And um, we kind of joked to him that we thought he'd be interested to meet people from a country that had discovered oil and got poorer. And um, he was astonished that we have levels of some levels of poverty in Scotland. And I think Alison mentioned that I think is a Calton in Glasgow mm -hmm. has a age expectancy of ma for males of 53 or 54 or something. So these were my kind of, um, I kept tagging visit Scotland with these. Um, it's kind of welcome to Scotland. So there's four prints. This one's, they're all lino cuts. This one is uh, highlighting that we have the highest heart attack rates in Europe. So we're top of the league for one, one thing anyway. Um, we also, particularly in Highland, we have the highest male suicide rate in Europe. Um, they're cheery. Mm. Uh, this was comparing Aberdeen to Dubai. Um, both are oil rich cities with a beach. However, 25% of Aberdonian children live in poverty and it's cold, you know, I just think poverty is worse when it's cold. 
And here we have the uh, 53.9 years is the male life expectancy in the Carlton area of Glasgow. It's called the, it's actually known in medical uh, circles as the Glasgow effect. So nice cheery prints, uh, at least they're colourful. So now lithography, I'll let Alison explain that mm -hmm. technique. Mm -hmm. oh, this is a lie. I'll have to go and see who's going to do it. Um, so lithography, this particular type of lithography is stone lithography. You can also do plate, metal plate and photo plate. That, that, this is a technique that I particularly love because there's something absolutely amazing about getting a slab of nature and drawing on it and, and taking a print from it. So um, this is a, a, me working on the print that's in the exhibition. I live in a place called Cromarty on the Black Isle, which is just northeast of um, Inverness. It's a fishing village, so it's completely surrounded by sea. And it's uh, the, the first the water there is um, incredibly deep. Um, so the, there's a fabrication yard and there's a lot of oil rigs stored in the Cromarty Firth. So I, I was looking at it, and Cromarty is also famous for fossil fish. Um, so I, all of these lovely images were mixed up in my head, you know, when I um, came up with this print. And the thing that I love about uh, stone lithography is these black, if you, the marks of the earth, the, the black ink here, you, you only get these specific marks with this technique. And the way that the marks are made mirror um, sedimentary processes that you see in nature. So there's real synergy between the technique and the mark making. Screen. Screen print, uh, slightly different to the other techniques in that it's probably the most commercial one. Um, it's, uh, there's no reversal in it um, and it tends to be acrylic now, the ink. So um, the images are photo exposed onto a screen and you print, this creates a stencil on the screen and you print, but the ink is pushed through, you can see the ink getting dragged across the screen here, pushed through the screen uh, with a squeegee, a rubber blade, which the screen is like a very fine curtain, if you like, a fine mesh, and the ink goes through the tiny little holes onto the paper. You can see it being manually done here as well, in, in our studio. So these are by an artist that we've worked with uh, called Fabric Lenny. Uh, he's from uh, Yorkshire in England and he was on a project called Sexy Pete, which I think I mentioned earlier on, which was, P -E -E this is P-E-A-T, -E not P-E-T-E. -E. So Pete is, um, if you imagine a, a landscape, which is almost the polar opposite of Kuwait, um, it's boggy, it's saturated in water, it's, and the peat is this kind of fibrous, um, soily plant growth that um, builds up to maybe seven metres deep in places. The two largest peat bogs in the world are both in Scotland, and this project was to highlight them because they're kind of overlooked and they're actually a bigger carbon sink than rainforests. So the art artists work with scientists um, and produced images from it. And they all, you know, they had freedom to look at any aspect of the bog they liked. And Paul, or Fabric Lenny as he's known, um, chose to look at mythology and kind of myths of creatures and so on who had lived on, on the bog in Lewis. We were, we were studying the, the Isle of Lewis bogland. So um, these are screen prints, you can see there's uh, they're, they're both uh, the same colour, so there's a three colour, the blue, the grey and the black. Um, yeah. 
Sarnath Banerjee. Now, Sarnath is uh, one of India's leading uh, graphic novel artists. Um, he came over to work on us with a project called Below Another Sky that linked um, Scotland with artists in various parts of the Commonwealth. Um, Sarnath um, is a kind of amazing character. When he, when he wasn't talking, we, we managed to do some screen prints with him. Um, he very much absorbed kind of traditional stories, but also current stories and even bits of gossip that he kind of heard while he was here and um, produced these in this kind of Indian graphic novel style. So this is a kind of take on, on Macbeth. Um, you can see the little owl logo that he produced while he was here as well. And it's on his prints. This was to do with, um, there was an eagle owl which had escaped and was loose in Inverness and it started attacking people, particularly I think Masons on their way to a Masonic meeting, it seemed to single them out. So sectarianism is alive and well in wildlife in Scotland. And this is his second one, which was this to do with- uh, this, is a, this is a story, it's, um, it's a kind of famous myth in Highland, Scotland, of a washerwoman. So if you see this washerwoman, it's a ghost, it's a ghost story, but uh, she goes down to the loch to wash her clothes. And if you see her, you're going to die. Or it, like it says on it, if you have seen her, you're already dead. Uh -huh. so. And Rosalind, Ros Lawless. Um... These, Ros Rosie's interest is her environment. She, she lives in an urban environment, so she, she can place around with everyday objects in those environments. And her prints are worked and reworked and worked again. You can see their collage. They're also mixed media. So she'll work with um, images she's printed, but also uh, she takes rubbings and various textures and photographs and she, uh, uh, these demonstrate how printmaking can, can be used in a mixed media format. Mm -hmm. And this is another one of Rosie's. Um, along a similar theme, you can see there's pastel marks, there's charcoal screen print. Rose is based in Glasgow, but she does uh, screen print tuition for us as well. So she's, mm -hmm. she's a great, great, great teacher. So the, these are screen prints by Rachel Duckhouse. And Rachel's amazing. She does residencies with scientists. So a lot of her work is inspired by scientists. Or in this case, she had a residency in Canada where she worked with water engineers and um, she drew patterns of the flow of water and the engineers were found working with her so inspiring that the residency was extended so she could work with them longer. She also works with scientists at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Um, I think it's Strathclyde at Mount Glasgow University, it's one or the other. And she works with scientists who are researching cellular growth. And this project came about, um, the, the scientists had a skull that had some rudimentary dentistry done to it. So they'd taken, um, I can remember how old the skull was. Oh, very, very old. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't okay. recent. <laughs> yeah, um, and they, they'd done some dentistry where they'd replaced a tooth with a, a piece of shell and the shell cells started to grow and fuse with the human bone structure. So it, it was an amazing discovery and Rachel is experimenting with cellular growth um, and she creates these charts of cell growth that the scientists have actually started working with because her drawings of cell growth are more accurate to reality than the computer modeling 
and graphs that they, they had been working with. Uh, this this uh, biocrystals, uh, this is slightly different. This is startling. So this isn't a screen print. This is leading us into etching. So Rachel has screen prints and this one etching in the, um, in the exhibition. Um, so I will take you through etching. I mean, I think this, this is still, is this still to do with the, 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 the cell growth? This is so, so yeah. again, it's um, another piece of Rachel's okay. link to the research with cell growth. Um, but the, the technique is different and we'll move on to etching. You can see there is, there is it's really quite different mark making. So etching. So etching uh, is quite different to screen. Um, first thing I said, screen is acrylic ink, so we tend to be in oil-based inks for etching. Uh, it's done generally on metal plates. Here we, we etch on copper and steel. Um, so there's a tendency for people to think that when they see an etching plate that it's been kind of scored and scratched into. It isn't, uh, you can see here, this piece of copper is coated with a thin layer of wax known as ground. Um, and then you're drawing, effectively drawing into the wax, exposing the metal. And then the plate is put in a, a bath of, uh, in, the, in this case, ferric chloride, or for steel, it would be nitric acid. And it's that etched solution that eats into the plate and makes the lines. Um, so the lines are positive lines. So if you remember lino cut at the start, where the ink's on the surface and not in the grooves, this is intaglio inking. We'll do, we should do a Q&A on you at the end of this so you remember all these terms. Um, the intaglio, the ink is the opposite. It's in the grooves and not on the surface. So this is part of the inking process. The ink is more or less pushed all over the plate and pushed into the grooves. And then it's gradually wiped away from the surface using a, a cloth called scrim. Um, and then it's put through the press with paper, which has been soaked in a bath to make it flexible, put through with a load of pressure. Um, and then you have your, your print that's pulled from, from the plate. So it's quite a slow inking process compared to screen. The screen is very quick. This is the opposite end of the scale. So, so the first one here is from Murray Robertson, again, Glasgow based. And this again is also from the Sexy Pete project. Uh, Murray um, chose to look at plant life and animal, uh, bird, insect, and so on life. Um, anybody who's been on the bog will know that there is significant levels of insects, particularly midges and clegs as we call them, horse flies in, you know, in England. Um, but Mark Murray, I mean, you can see these are beautifully drawn into the metal, etched into the metal. It's quite large, 60 centimetres. Um, the, the prints are direct, which means that, you know, the paper goes straight onto the metal plate. It's peeled off, so everything's in reverse. So that means that the text here um, has to be done in reverse. And he has the names of each of these plants and animals in, in English, as well as in Gaelic, which is the indigenous Highland and most of Scotland language, um, which tends to be much more descriptive. And, uh, you know, I don't know if poetic's the right word, but certainly more descriptive and, and more, uh, you know, it really brings these animals and these bogs to life, if, if you understand what the Gaelic names are. Okay. Ian McNichol. Ian McNichol. Ian McNichol um, is uh, based in Glasgow, works at Glasgow Print Studio, and these are etchings which are a fair size, 35 centimetres square. And I, I just, the, these are great because they're just an exploration of colour and shape. And if you love colour, they, they, lovely thing about etching is it's so tactile because the, the paper has an emboss. You, you do want to touch them and, and just feel the surface of them. And the, that wax ground that John mentioned when you're etching and re-etching, 
it's sometimes it can break down and it causes marks that you see. These random marks you see in the background are foul bite, which means uh, you, you've not necessarily controlled them or asked for them, but they're, they're sometimes what gives an image life. And so they're lovely things to have. There are happy accidents. The inks we use in etching are oil-based, which means you can get these incredibly intense colours with them. And um, yeah, I just love them. Mm -hmm. You can see, if you remember from the, the slide of the inking, that, that wiping, um, it makes it quite tricky to keep ink very defined in an area. And you, you can see something that's actually quite nice, I think, about these is that slight bleed of the, you can see it on the, the maroon and the cerise as it's wiped, it's just slight bleeding can be really quite attractive as well. And Bronwyn, uh, Bronwyn Slay is a, a very successful artist. We've had quite a long association with Bronwyn. I think we, she had a residency with us. 2005. Yeah, long time ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and Bronwyn, I think, uh, then and probably now still loves these uh, geometric shapes of uh, buildings. At the time with our residency, she was really loved the, the you know, we, we, we're in an area that's very uh, rural and sometimes very wild, but you still get these kind of quite industrial buildings now and again. Um, so we have like our oil industry in the Cromarty Firth, for instance, is in, in this, you know, very kind of remote Firth, but you've got all these oil rigs and stuff coming in. Uh, so there's things like that that crop up throughout the Highlands. Um, and Bronwyn, I think, found quite a lot of uh, inspiration from these mm -hmm. things at the time. Yeah, Bronwyn uh, has taught with us through, since then through most of that period and um, uh, she comes up and teaches classes, teaches etching, what else has done photo light as well. And like most of the artists in the, the, the exhibition, um, they, they have an international profile as well. So through the residencies and exhibitions. I love this one. Well, if Bronwyn's listening, she could sell you one. <laughs> I think Bronwyn <laughs> might be listening. <laughs> yeah. So this is Pamela Tate, who's uh, an artist who's not only uses the studio, but is now one of our board of directors. Um, I'm sure she won't mind me saying that uh, she came to us with, uh, she got a, an award to learn printmaking because she wasn't a printmaker. And uh, I remember when she came in, the first thing she said was, uh, the, the one thing I don't really fancy is etching. And I managed to persuade her to try a little bit of everything um, to see, you know, rather than say, I don't want to do this, or do you want to do this? So you just try and see how it goes. And uh, I think, Pamela said to me, she now uh, lives, eats and sleeps etching. Um, and she's pretty damn good at it. Uh, so these are, um, this is Roots and Rust. Um, I think Pamela does these, again, without seeing the landscape here, the, the Black Isle, which is where Pamela lives. It's not actually an island, Scotland's full of these kind of strange things. Um, it's a kind of... Scotland. هذه هي مناطق ريفية وهي مناطق مرتفعة. Between them, so when you're driving along, the, the horizon might be tree belts, um, uh, maybe you know not not massively high, maybe three four hundred feet high, um, and uh, she draws these tree shapes and uh, fits these kind of figures into the shapes of the trees. Um, you really yeah. have to ask her what the hell she's seen inside her own head, but um, they're great mm -hmm. creations. So this is another one, and you, you can see this has been inspired by the cross section of a tree trunk. So uh, Pamela stares is at them long enough to, to her head has spilled with this. Um, they're, Amazing etchings, aren't they? Mm -hmm. 
but it was just the, the range of tone that, because these are, certainly this one is single colour and the range of tone that's created by, well, it, it's, it's patience and commitment and it, to get the tone, you, you're putting the plate in and out of the acid bath and painting or stopping areas out each time and that enables you to get a range of tone into your plate and um, the detail of these are, is just mm -hmm. amazing. The plates themselves can look uh, really lovely as well, the metal that's so worked and um, it kind of builds up a patina so that the plates can be really nice things. These always think these are like a kind of etching form of an exorcism really. <laughs> So uh, Polymer Photogravure, kind of grandiose title. Um, photogravure is an, an oldish technique, uh, which kind of in the early years of photography, um, photographers were generally seen as scientists and wanted to be seen more as artists. So they, this technique was one of the ways to do that. It kind of, if you like, brought a fusion of photography and printmaking and therefore gave more of a kind of fine art feel to the photography. Um, it's traditionally done on uh, copper plates, but there's a, a more modern uh, solution or, or alternative, if you like, called polymer plates, which are steel-backed plates with a, a light sensitive polymer coating. Um, so to give you a rough idea of how this happens, um, we this this is work by uh, that you'll see in a minute by Kasper Kowalski. Um, so we create a, a positive, um, which we're doing digitally here, the, the large digital printer printing onto transparency, um, and then the plate is photo exposed with the transparency. You can see the transparency on the glass plate getting laid on top. And they develop in water, which is quite amazing. So there's no actual etch like there would be with the copper. It's all developed in water. But they're inked in exactly the same way as the etching plates that you saw earlier on. And they give this remarkable uh, depth of tone. Um, the, it's the only photographic technique where you get direct contact with the paper from a you know, physical contact, in this case, a plate. Um, and the oil-based inks give these dense blacks that you could dive into. So that's the kind of secret of, of that tonal range. Uh, it's, it um, sometimes gives a very 3D look to um, the, the finished image. Um, so these, again, from the Sexy Pete project, Kasper Kowalski uh, was, is a remarkable Polish aerial photographer based just outside Gdansk. Um, and when we set up the, I'd, I'd seen his work in a photography magazine. He was, I think he was one of the Sony World Photographers of the Year at the time. And I kind of remember having a conversation with Alison, that he'd be great on the Peak project. And Alison said, well, give him a, why don't we get in touch with him? And I said, well, why would he come and work with us? And uh, she persuaded me and within a couple of hours, he'd replied and agreed to do the project. So he was, he was great to work with. Um, normally a lot of, you know, now a lot of aerial photographers use drones, but Casper is actually up there in a paraglider with his feet dangling, a propeller on his back and his camera kind of strapped around his waist. So he flew about maybe 500 feet above the bog and took these amazing images, which he'd never worked in black and white, never, I think, even heard of photogravure, so it was all relatively new to him. But the images are great and again you see these are the bog land like I said earlier is completely wet even where it looks like it's not but you can see these lochens which are like it's a Scottish word for sort of small lakes and these little burns or rivers that run through it they tend to look very black and black and white <coughs> excuse me um, and he called this its skin you can see why it's a bit like an elephant close up there's another one, and this one I think you might be able to see quad bike tracks around the river that give a scale. It's a set of four. <coughs> um, 
and this is the last one is sphagnum moss which floats on the top of the Loch Ness which the, the, the peat gives the water a kind of it almost looks a bit like beer or something it's very dark in its color so that's why from above it looks so black particularly in, in, in the monochrome photos but a lovely set these they're quite large and you see them on the wall together they're, they're, they're great you could live with them easily and the, this was a project um, we did with print studios in England, Sweden and Finland. And each studio I had invited a set number of artists to um, produce work for joint exhibitions. And this is by artist Joanne B. Carr, who lives up as far north as you can go in Scotland, um, right up the top. Uh, and she came down to the studio and she brought this photo and the jumper. So you can see this is a picture of Joanne wearing the jumper. She's caught, don't know what kind of fish it is, um, vegetarian, don't know if you can tell. But um, we created this photograph reviewer. Um, by photographing the jumper, and John, you'd be able to explain what you did there. Well, but in, in Photoshop, we, she had the actual wee jumper. It was a jumper that I think was knitted in, in Becula, one of the Scottish islands. Uh, we're an amazing knitter, so lovely quality. Um, photographed it, and in Photoshop, we kind of made it look like Joanne was actually part of the fabric of the jumper. So it's the whole thing about memories really and the importance, you know, of something like an object like this small uh, cardigan or jumper can trigger all these memories within you. Um, so that was, um, once that image was complete, again, it was then processed onto the, the plate. Um, it was printed in this sort of warm black and then she's carefully what's called hand tinting on the dry print. We, she's tinted watercolour to give that slight colour in the pattern. And then the text was screen printed on top of the image. So it's kind of a combination of two or three techniques there all coming together in the one print. It's quite, quite a small wee print, but um, really quite jewel-like, I suppose. So these, um, this is another series of four prints. Um, the project was called The Lord and Other Sky, and these are by our Scottish artist Liz Ogilvie, Elizabeth Ogilvie. And Liz, um, Liz tends, to, her work is generally large scale installations with water and ice. Quite a lot of the artists we work with don't have any printmaking experience or very little. We bring the printmaking experience, they bring the ideas. So when we first met Liz, she came up to the studio to meet with us uh, to produce work for the final exhibition. And uh, she did say she's got, she said, I have a plan B. And we thought, all right, what's coming? And plan A was, would you be able to print onto ice? So I got very excited once again because John was doing the work and his goal, yeah, that's brilliant. And um, you actually got frostbite. I, I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Burns on my fingers from handling these pieces <laughs> of ice. Really, it wasn't so much. I mean, we, I managed to get the print working really quite nicely on the ice. Uh, so we were printing the, 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 the words, the secret language of ice. To give you an idea of the scale of these, the prints are bigger than the, the, the actual piece of ice. Um, the, we, we used loaf tins like for baking loaves, bread loaves. And we'd fill them with a little bit of ice uh, and then we had about one minute window to screen print onto the ice. Um, Liz was more concerned about the bubble structure in the ice and getting that looking nice, which, you know, we will really, Liz, that's not our game. How do we get it? So we, we were trying all sorts of different freezers. And I think the best freezer was your freezer at home. Alison lives two doors away from me. So we'd a little bit more room in, in, in my kitchen. So we'd run down with the ice from Alison's house into my freezer. 
and then we had this portable kit where we screen printed the, the word, the, the language, the, sorry, the, the text onto it, uh, which was really pin sharp, almost sharper than it would be on, on, uh, on paper. And then it was photographed as it melted uh, in my kitchen. I think we had about 18 attempts or something, hence the frostbite oh, to get this. We, we cut it uh, because um, Liz, each time we froze, uh, Liz would go, no, I don't really like the structure within the eyes. Um, so we tried different types of water. We tried boiling water, like a cool freezer. We tried ionized water, we tried filtered water, we tried all sorts of water. water. We didn't hot try water. holy water, maybe no. we should have tried that. No. Um, but eventually we got some structures uh, Liz was happy with. Um, and I, I, it's quite frustrating because when you look at this first print in the series, it just looks like it's photoshopped. Like the, the text has been photoshopped on top of the image. But that's the actual ink, so the screen printing ink on the ice. And as John said, it was sharper than you get on paper. It was absolutely crisp. So there's four of them, and you can see the sequence that as it gradually starts to melt, the ink bled out. Uh, the ink, there was something in the ink that made it melt a little bit quicker where the ink was. So you'd get this pool and then it would suddenly sort of burst out, giving these kind of tree-like forms um, as it went. So the, the finished bit of the project was, I know I said we screen printed, but the prints aren't screen prints. The screen print was on the ice. The photographs became photogravure prints, and that's what this series of prints is. Um, so they are, you can see it's 67 centimetres, they're quite a bit bigger than a loaf of bread. So they were enlarged um, and made quite a bit bigger, but they could take that because the texture is quite amazing in them. So, so that was, I mean, she, she finished up by saying maybe, maybe the next time we could go up into Cairngorm and print on ice up a mountain. So Alison probably agreed to that as well. So there we go. That's the exhibition. Okay, so that's um, from Malaput, Arabia. Um, it's a, a shame uh, you can't see the actual prints, but hopefully a digital version is um, some compensation for that. So I think um, if anyone has any questions, um, I believe you indicate by putting your hand up. Is that right? think so, yeah. So maybe there won't be any. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, hi, John. Hi, Alison. Hi. Um, hi, yeah. Thank, thank, thanks for the um, presentation. It's very good. I enjoyed it very much. Um, my question is, uh, the, the exhibition, is it also available to view in terms of the, the prints you've shown? Is it available to view um, individual images? Yes. Um, what what we're going to do is while the exhibition is online, um, we, we, always, we don't have space to put the full exhibition up, but we can rotate images. So um, we will, that's what we'll do throughout. Uh, the online exhibition is on from now till the 1st of February. That's um, on our website, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. On that's the studio's website. And we'll we'll put work up through that period. Yeah. We'll we'll get we'll get the work on the walls here. Like Alison says, there's not enough wall space here to get it all, but we'll we'll rotate it. We only got it back from Jeddah a couple of months ago, I think. It was stuck in Jeddah throughout the lockdown. So so it's back here now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, Ian, I think we have yeah. a question from Ian. I can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Ian, yeah. Hi, yes. you know, you're joining us from Kuwait. <laughs> so, uh, when, when are, you, are you likely to be returning to the Middle East, uh, say, next year when we're back to life as we used to know it? Um, well, we don't, don't, don't have any plans to um, go out to the, the no. Gulf. Um, but we'd love to go back out there because 
it was it was an amazing experience and there, there was a lot of enthusiasm for um what we were doing out there and uh, a lot of interest in printmaking um, so it would be great to go back out there's also the option of online teaching yeah, yeah. as well um yeah. or online presentations this is the first we've done so it, um, thank you all for being guinea pigs. Yeah. <laughs> You're totally welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it'd be, it'd be, I mean, I think we would love to go back out and you always feel there's more, you know, the time we were there, you're giving an intro and you could obviously do mm -hmm. a lot more and carry on the links, but also continue teaching. So maybe it's something we could talk to British Council about, I don't know. Also, it would be um, great to see you uh, people from the Gulf come out, come to see us, and certainly we we had um, there was a couple of people um, from Jeddah from the work we did in Jeddah. Um, one, the, uh, Neela had already started planning her grand tour of Scotland, and obviously spending a bit of time at the studio, and the pandemic has. Uh, it, couldn't have brought told yeah. to that. Um, but we, we're hoping to continue. We're still in touch with mm -hmm. people from yeah. uh, the places we visited. Yeah. So we're really hoping once life gets back to some sort of normality yeah. that we can continue those relationships. Yeah. yeah. Maybe coming over to buy a castle or two as well. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if we'll get any more. So I think we're we're nearly at the end of our hour. So um I think we can probably just okay. wrap it up and thank, thank everybody. Uh -huh. I'm just seeing some comments so in the chat. So thank you so much to everyone for those comments and uh, thank you very much for um, coming and listening to us. And thank you to all of the artists for uh, contributing to the exhibition. Um, we're, we're really glad that we could include your work in it and um, take it out on the tour of the Gulf. Yeah, and for those in Kuwait, we have a, an, an event starting on Wednesday um, and you get the details uh, through us or through Wager as well mm -hmm. or the British Council in Kuwait. So uh, lastly before we leave I would just like to thank the British Council for um, supporting this project. It really has been um, an amazing experience. It's been an absolute privilege to get to know the Gulf region better. Um, we we um, we loved the commonality between the countries, but we also loved discovering how unique each each part of the region was, and uh, and also um, parts of it reminded us of Scotland and parts of it reminded us of places in Scotland mm -hmm. and um, and just the, the connections we've made, it's been a privilege. And thank you to Aziz as well for supporting the project. Michael, would you like to say anything? I just want to say I, I really enjoyed that, just to, to thank you. Um, I particularly enjoyed the, the stories and the connection with place, you know, it, took us to the north of Scotland and and also in unusual ways, you know, from the social and unexpected sort of things like poverty, and but also the, the peat bogs and the, you know, and not, not what you expect when you think of, uh, you know, um, artistic representations of, Scot representations of Scotland. So, so much more interesting. And it made me wonder what some of our Kuwait, Kuwaiti artist colleagues might, might do how would they do the equivalent with these techniques? How might they represent their, 
um, the yeah. stories and the place, you know, the sea, the desert, pearls, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things that Alison mentioned is sort of common. Sort of maybe 20 or so years, I think there has been a kind of uh, rediscovery and re examination of Scottish culture in, in what I, I think is quite a healthy way. And I, I kind of sense that that was happening in some of the countries we visited and, you know, new ways to look at how they present Arabic art and Arabic you know, tradition, which I think is so rich and so, um, some of the places we visited, the, the visuals are just remarkable. And, um, you know, they, they, they were doing it when we were still kind of playing about with mud. So, um, you know, so there's a, I think that there's, there's a kind of common thread there, I think, as well, in what's happened, what's been happening in Scotland and, and across some of the Gulf states. So, yeah, it's good. Thank you. Thank you. So Okay. Okay, if we have no more questions, I think we will wrap it up there. And um, just a reminder uh, that we will be doing some, um, there's a programme of events we're doing in collaboration with um, Weja and Aziz and um, look them up. And yeah. we're looking forward to working with, um, doing some printmaking workshops with uh, some Real people in Kuwait. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Cheerio. Thank you.